Good morning, everyone in the US, and good afternoon from those of you who are joining us from Europe. Good evening for those of you who are like me and in Asia now. So I am Xing Lei Li. I am from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Today, I'm happy to moderate this session uh, for Eddie Riedel's research. And Eddie is a very influential and productive accounting research, uh, researcher from the University of Boston. And his research focuses on three mega trends, as, she, as he mentioned in his website. And I look through his, all, all of his papers. I think I can't go through them because that will take more than one hour, which is the time we have today. But today we're re very excited to have Eddie to take, uh, talk about uh, more of a new, new topic in the financial reporting, which is the changes in risk factor disclosures and the variance risk premium. Now I'm going to share with you some housekeeping rooms in the chat box and Eddie would like to have the first five minutes uninterrupted and the last five minutes uninterrupted to wrap, wrap up the talk. But other than that, um, please feel free to raise your hand or you type your comment in the chat box so that I can raise the questions to Eddie. Okay, so without further ado, I'll give the floor to Eddie. Okay, very good. Thank you so much, um, Ayung and Shinlei, for your kind invitation to present uh, at the ADP. And ex by extension, uh, thank you to Stephen Penman. And so let me just uh, share my screen and we can get started. And we'll pay close attention to the clock. I know it's a one hour presentation, so I'll try to keep everybody on time. And so this paper is co-authored between myself. Uh, it's also with uh, Matt Lyle that many of you may know from Northwestern, a University of Toronto uh, graduate. Then also on the presentation as well, if you can see him in the box, uh, Federico is joining. Uh, so Federico is a PhD student here at BU. And I would uh, not be doing my duty if I didn't uh, give a little kudos to him. So he is going to be on the job market this year. And he has done several truly outstanding things, uh, including he's actually taught and in fact provided input and helped us to design an analytics class that is ready to go. And uh, he also has an incredible portfolio of work focused on textual analysis, some of which you'll be able to see uh, in this paper. And in my opinion, he makes the best espresso in this hemisphere. So anyway, keep Federico in mind if you're on the job market, he's an outstanding candidate. And then you have me and my high school picture and the free rider on the paper. All right, so let's get started. You know, I just need a handful of minutes. I just wanna to try to set up uh, the general where we're going with the paper and what we're trying to do. The broad question that we're trying to ask focuses on this idea of companies and their risk disclosures and how these disclosures can be signals that help inform about uh, the, to the equity market about the company's risk and risk profile. And so really at heart, what we're trying to do is we're trying to go beyond the typical first moment of uh, stock returns and understanding how prices behave and look at this, uh, these higher moments uh, focused on risk and uncertainty surrounding risk. And so, what we'll be talking about, we are, are gonna come up with a proxy, a risk disclosure proxy. That proxy is really gonna leverage uh, Federico's expertise in textual analysis. And what we're gonna be doing is uh, extracting information off of companies 10K filings. They have a risk factor section, and that's gonna be uh, that we're gonna be able to build our proxy for risk disclosures. And then we're gonna see, uh, see to what extent that helps to effect and generally uh, that the provision of additional signals about risk helps to inform the market and that that in turn is going to help to reduce uh, the market's uncertainty about uncertainty. And so the uncertainty about uncertainty, that's a key construct uh, within this literature. And in a little while, we'll talk about the market outcome variable that we're examining. Uh, the outcome variable is implied volatilities or that are used to derive what's called the variance risk premium. And so maybe what I'd like to do now is let me turn it over for a second to Federico. And he's just gonna describe a little bit about this idea of what uncertainty about uncertainty represents to help you understand it. Federico, you wanna jump in? 
All right. Thanks, Eddie. Uh, thanks uh, to the organizers and thanks everyone for attending. Hopefully you can hear me well. So I would like to uh, talk for a few minutes about this theoretical construct of uncertainty about uncertainty. And the reason is that, as Eddie was mentioning before, usually when we think about capital markets research, financial research, and research that has to do with risk in capital markets, we think about the second moment of either the stock returns distribution or the future cash flows distributions. However, uh, it's important to note that this is not the only risk that gets priced in equity markets. And therefore, this is not the only risk which affects uh, traders' decisions and actions in equity markets. And so one way to see what uncertainty about uncertainty is, is to think about a very stylized asset pricing model in which the price of a security is the uh, expectation about future uh, discounted cash flows minus a risk premium. Now, the risk premium is multiplied by a factor, uh, and this factor is basically and represents the exposure of a given firm uh, to, to risk. Now, uh, clearly, if the factor exposure, and so this row coefficient is known with certainty, the only thing that affects the risk premium is the uncertainty or the variance or the second moment that surrounds firm's future cash flows. However, if this risk factor, sorry, if this uh, factor exposure is uncertain, and so it's not known with certainty, and it needs to be estimated, then uh, the uncertainty or the variance around the estimation of this row coefficient also contributes to the risk premium. And basically, this is the main idea about uncertainty surrounding uncertainty. The variance or the uncertainty about this coefficient is what uh, effectively drives uh, uh, or we characterize as uncertainty about uncertainty. And this is the theoretical construct that we try to look at in this paper, uh, where the idea is that we try to understand how uh, uh, signals, information signals that are sourced from the textual disclosure system, and so in particular from the risk factor section of 10Ks, uh, relate to uncertainty about uncertainty, and so hopefully affect uh, the expectation about uh, uh, uncertainty surrounding future cash flows variants. Okay, so at this point, you know, maybe I'll just add uh, before uh, we open up for questions, uh, whenever you folks want to chime in. You know, part of the, when we think about this paper, part of the policy implications, I guess, that we're thinking about is to try and understand the disclosure environment surrounding risk, which is a little bit different than the environment around uh, traditional financial reporting topics. And so one of the ways that we're trying to think about the implications of this paper is that it may help to inform, uh, for example, uh, regulators, uh, the SEC, to think about what's the best way to structure information in the risk domain to allow investors to understand what are the exposures that a company uh, faces. And that's what a lot of these disclosures will relate to as we'll talk about in a minute. So let me just, at, at this point, um, I think this was enough uh, time for us to kind of set up our and tee up our uh, discussion. So if you guys have any questions, you can chime in or you can raise your hand, whatever you're comfortable with. There are three questions on to you now. The first one is from Oliver. Oliver, would you like to open up your mic and speak? Yeah, sure. I mean, it was just a clarification question about the framework, because I mean, right there, you say that you look at the expected discounted cash flows. So I was just wondering when you discount those cash flows in that framework, whether you discount at the risk free rate, because otherwise, when you subtract the risk, risk premium after, it seems like you would do the same thing twice, really. The, I mean, I, Frederico, you can chime in too, but the way that I, I think about it, and this is this uncertainty about uncertainty, you know, this is really not a novel idea that we're introducing. This is actually a really pretty standard idea within the finance literature, just to understand historically uh, and position where it's come from. It's really the idea there's uncertainty. There's going to be, as uh, you describe, Oliver, there's going to be a cash flow type notion, there's going to be a discount rate applied to that. There's a question mark about what the appropriate discount rate is going to be, what's the risk that the company faces, and how do you identify that? Uncertainty about uncertainty is about trying to understand what that measure is supposed to be and what that uh, correct rate is supposed to be as well. So that row coefficient that you see right there, 
that's really trying to understand that that's a dynamic uh, variable that can move up and down depending on the company and its exposure to different risk factors. And in the literature, when they talk about uncertainty about uncertainty, it's identifying what that row coefficient is. That's what investors are not sure about because uh, it's unclear how to uh, what that factor is supposed to be. And as a result, there's variance around understanding what that factor even is going to be as well. Does that make sense, uh, Oliver? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Thank you. Um, I, I, th I think I get it. I, um, um, but uh, could you could you just maybe elaborate? I'm, I'm, I'm a bit slow here. I think um, so. When you discount these cash flows, what's the discount rate? Is it just ten year rate on government bonds, or is it is it a, a, the cost of capital of the firm? So we're not discounting anything. Mm -hmm. This is just a formulation to represent. Um, the firm and the firm's valuation. And it's the idea that through the investor lens, an investor also is grappling with the idea of what is the appropriate discount rate supposed to be. There is variance, not just about cash flows, there's variance about what is the appropriate discount rate supposed to be as applied to the firm. That's uncertainty about uncertainty. I don't know what the right discount rate is. And there's a distribution around that rope uh, parameter right there as well. That, that's all it is. So in our estimation, that's all reflected through the variance risk premium, which we'll talk about uh, in a little bit. But that's the, the basic uh, structure of what this uh, model is trying to capture. Thank you. Okay. Great. Yeah. Now the second question will be from Sudipta. Mm -hmm. Hi, Eddie. Uh, hey, Sudipta. Good morning. Hey. So, um, from the econ and finance literature, there's older concepts called ambiguity, ambiguity aversion and all of that. And there's also sort of 19 uncertainty, uncertainty about, you know, risk is where you know the parameters and uncert uncertainty under night is when you don't know the parameters. So is this the same as that? Or is there some distinction that, that you have in your mind from uh, these older concepts? No, th thank you for raising that. and. It's in the paper as we have it written right now, we don't refer uh, to these older papers that uh, Sadipta just mentioned. It's actually quite similar to that ambiguity type notion, right? It's, it's uh, very much this idea about uncertainty about what the factor is supposed to be. And there are some classic papers uh, by Knight um, and others that have done that and they've coined it a little bit differently. I think as the literature the more recent literature uses this terminology, but I think it refers to a very similar economic construct. And honestly, I think in our writing, we need to bring that more in that's currently not in the paper. Thank and you. The, and the third is more like a comment from Jonathan Grover. Jonathan, would you like to ask it or is- Oh, I could, I could just briefly say that, I mean, actually I don't think to me it sounds so related to Nighty and uncertainty in the sense that it's supposed to be something that you can't quantify. To me, it sounds like you're, maybe I'm wrong, but you're quantifying the uncertainty about Rho. So to me, it just seems like another form of uncertainty that you've got uncertainty about the cash flows and you've got uncertainty about the discount rate. But as long as you can you know, quantify that, uh, then it sounds like just another form of uncertainty to me. But anyway, I'll listen. And so let me, maybe it'll be helpful. Let me move into some of the theory and maybe that'll help to give a little bit more structure on this. So the paper builds on a couple of other publications, uh, particularly by Heinle and Smith and then Heinle Smith and Varekia. And part of these papers are trying to understand this idea about how disclosures, uh, particularly disclosures regarding risk, will help investors to understand certain distributions. And again, again, we distinguish between there are uh, there are multiple distributions in this type of framework. There's the distribution about cash flows. Yes, that's one source of uncertainty. But then there's a distribution about what types of risks that the company actually faces. That's a different and distinct source of uncertainty. And in these models, as they presented, the notion is that as a firm provides risk factor signals, that is, as they give any type of information to investors, 
What it allows investors to do is to basically build the distribution. They now start to better understand what is the uncertainty that the company faces? What's that row parameter? What's the distribution of that thing actually look like? And so as they uh, obtain those signals, that in turn allows them to better formulate this distribution. And that in turn leads to a reduction in this particular type of uncertainty. So again, this is not uncertainty regarding cash flows. This is uncertainty regarding the risk factor, uh, the row that we talked about. And so that in turn manifests in terms of reduced uncertainty about uncertainty, uncertainty about the firm risk. So in the hypothesis, as we build it up and as we try to anchor it to these two papers, the primary uh, hypothesis that we have is that as companies are providing more signals of these individual risk factor exposures, what we expect to see is that there's gonna be a negative relationship between those and investor perceptions of uncertainty about firm risk. And just to be clear, when we talk about this uncertainty notion, right? That this like, uh, I guess, any other price formation type notion or measure, there's an expectation operate around this. This is what investors are thinking, looking into the future. So there's a horizon and they're thinking about the variability of company outcomes and the uncertainty around those. And so again, these are all forward-looking measures, not uh, ex post measures. Yes, how young looks like you raise your hand? Yeah, Eddie, um, Federico, I just have a clarifying question. So it sounds like your story is simply just information helps investors reduce their information risk, right? So uncertainty about certain valuation parameters. The parameter you picked today is the sensitivity to some risk premium. So think about there's a climbing risk depending on where the firm actually has their facilities, that sensitivity changes over time. But outsiders do not have full information about that sensitivity to certain risks, for example, environmental climate, risks. So disclosures help investors reduce that information uncertainty around that particular parameter. That's Is correct. something you have in mind? That, that That's correct. Just... But, but I guess the one thing I want to highlight in, in how you phrase it, it's actually a, it's a good example to think about. Again, keep these as two distinct notions. That is, if a company has exposure to, for example, an environmental risk per se, the risk of the company can increase right? The distribution of cash flows can increase uh, because the company now faces higher risk because of climate change, regulation, whatever you want to characterize it. But the uncertainty about the risk can go down. So again, these are two yes. distinct sources of yes. uncertainty. It's important to keep that in mind because yes. I think um, in, in this literature, I think it's easy to get confused that those two necessarily have to move in tandem and they don't. They don't necessarily yes. have to move in tandem. Yeah, I agree with you. I think there's another literature in, in finance uh, as about estimation risk. And then initially they use the age of the firm is that over time, the firm's underlying risk activities uh, or business activities may change. So that cash flow risk or risk parameters actually can change over time, but over time investor has, has better information. That's but I think here you do something finer is actually using disclosure quality to disentangle the quality or precision of the information uh, right. investors have. Thank that's, you. That's the notion. Yep. Okay. I think Sudipta has a um, related question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think this uh, assumption that information is going to reduce this uncertainty is questionable. So, I mean, Beaver 68 says that when he defines information, he specifically has a footnote that says, I do not define information as reducing risk. And the idea is that if a firm is changing through time, the information could actually increase your uh, risk. And the same would apply for the risk premium, I think. I don't, if the risk premium can change through time, the information, the signals could actually increase your uncertainty about what that distribution is. You know, I guess the, the way I think about it, Sudipta, and I, I, I kind of agree with that, the qualification I would put is that, particularly in the Heinlein Smith paper, the way that they characterize it is that the signal, and again, let's focus on the uncertainty about uncertainty, that parameter, right? Because again, I, the risk about cash flows, I view as a, it's a different aspect of the company. In the Heinlein Smith paper, the way I think we're interpreting it uh, and the way I think that they 
kind of proposed that it, it provides empirical predictions. Again, these are both, uh, just to be clear, they're both uh, theory papers, um, the two papers cited above. And in the Heinlein Smith paper, I think what they discuss is this idea that when a signal goes out, when information, so you can call it information or a signal, use those mm -hmm. interchangeably. When a signal goes out, what it does is it allows the investor to basically now understand what type of distribution I now face. That's what it's doing. It's putting me on a distribution. And by putting me on a distribution in the uncertainty of uncertainty type notion, I might not know which distribution I'm moving on. And the signal now allows me to park myself on one of those distributions. That's the sense in which it should undo, reduce uncertainty about uncertainty, uncertainty about that row factor. That's the idea. Again, but I, I thought Beaver's explanation, I thought was that, but the signal itself can also lead to a higher risk outcome for the company. And that relates to Ah Young's comment, I think, uh, before. No, I don't think Beaver is talking about changing the risk of the company. It's just that you learn from the information that it's riskier than you thought. So the issue here is suppose you had some cross signals and you had a fairly tight prior on a particular distribution. Mm -hmm. Now you get a draw from a from that doesn't fall in that distribution. So it's in a tail. So, but now you're going to have to explore a whole bunch of other distributions that could come from. And so that's the sense in which I, unless that you assume that this uh, distribution is sort of fixed in time for all time, so long as that distribution itself can change over time, I can't see how it would reduce your uncertainty for mm -hmm. sure. I mean, I can see that if the, that distribution is constant over time, you will reduce it. But if that distribution can change over time, then I don't see how you could possibly come up with a sort of firm conclusion. So I agree that in the theory paper, they make certain assumptions, but uh, so, but you have to sort of, you know, those assumptions are assumptions. Absolutely. And the real data may not always fit the assumption. That's great. I mean, so when we, when we set up the hypothesis, we set it up as a one-tailed, basically anchoring to these papers. Uh, what's helpful about the comet is maybe you know, we could certainly go back to these classic papers like Beaver and now think about whether or not there's justification to make it and think about motivating as a two-tailed test. And so that, that's actually really, really helpful. Are there any I other think a very, quick, a very quick one kind of follow up on Sudipta's point. I mm -hmm. think you can take a look at Roger Skinner and Van Berska 2009. I think yep. they test a very similar theory, uh, but what I find is actually those guidance increases uh, in private volatility. So they, their section two is quite helpful. Try to yep. lay out two stories, one story so you have, the other one is probably something that Steve had, had in mind. Yep. That's great, that's very helpful. And again, very familiar with that paper also, so that's good. Okay, all right, let me keep going. And so, you know, again, kind of follow on to our discussion now with Sadipta and uh, Ayung. So the way it's uh, structured right now, we have it as a single tail test. Uh, the tension that we put in for why we don't believe that it would be that, it, that we would find this prediction is that there's a lot of discussion, particularly in the section that we're going to be exploring from the 10K, that these disclosures tend to be boilerplate type disclosures. Uh, there's a lot of criticism that's been received that companies provide this information. And really it's, it's not additional information that's helpful to investors, but it's really just driven by uh, the law for, uh, uh, department within the firm, just wanting to make sure that the company's protected in the event of a litigation event. And so that provides some of the tension uh, within the paper. You know, the other thing I wanna to mention too is that uh, there are a couple of limitations to the paper as well. We focus on the variance risk premium and we focus on that particular construct. We don't look, there are other moments that you can look at skewness, kurtosis, and other measures as well, market outcomes that look at different distributions. We don't examine those, nor do we examine the cost of capital. And principally because if we, again, just anchor it back to the papers we're building off, the prediction seems clearest when you talk about this uncertainty about uncertainty about this variance risk premium measure. And so we're trying to maintain, I think in some sense, a pretty clear uh, prediction. In these other moments, the prediction becomes a bit more ambiguous. 
in some sense, that may relate to some of the story that uh, Sadifta was just presenting before. And so that might be something that we need to just more carefully consider and, and build into the paper a little bit more explicitly. So now I'm just gonna take a couple of minutes to go through what it is that we're doing and what these factors are. And so the setting that we're using is uh, we're getting the information from firms 10K filings and the specific item is something called item 1A. And the SEC has a 2005 mandate that companies are required to disclose all material risks. That for us is actually a really important requirement because risk disclosures can be found in a lot of places. You can go uh, in part to the MDNA, you can go into annual reports, you could certainly go into CSR reports or other types of items. The difference is that the SEC mandate, what it does is it puts a floor on what companies uh, have to provide. And what it does in this section is presumably, uh, assuming that it's being enforced uh, correctly, it avoids the self-selection that other voluntary disclosure uh, channels would have. And that's what we're trying to do. We wanted to identify a setting where you would be able to identify all the material risks that a company faces. And so in theory, this item 1A does that. The other disclosure channels that one could certainly consider, and they're all listed right there, uh, the challenge with those is that they're selective. Management will tend to pick out specific risks that they want to emphasize or uh, for various reasons, maybe even de-emphasize or not uh, talk about. And so the use of the 10K 1A section hopefully avoids some of that and minimizes some of the endogeneity that can happen. And then not surprising, this is gonna benefit, uh, this is coming as a management source as opposed to an outside source such as an analyst uh, for, uh, report or something like that. Management should be in the best position to understand the unique risks, the idiosyncratic risks that a company faces. And so uh, we felt that that's the strongest way to try, try to identify this information. And the other thing that's actually quite unique about this, and this is where uh, Federico's expertise is really gonna come to shine, the requirement within the SEC is not just that you lay out the risks, it's that you have to identify each individual separable risk and you have to provide a descriptive heading for it as well. And typically the way that this is done is done through a bolded or italicized type format. And so if I can just um, get to actually an example, just so you can see. Here's an example from Chevron 2009-2010. This is their 2010 annual report. And what you can see is that Chevron, it's item 1A, this is right out of their report. And you can see in the bold italicized sentence, they have to list their uh, the management's description of what the risk factor is. And so you can see right there uh, in the red boxes what those are. And what management does is they'll give a one sentence description and then what they'll do is they'll provide a, a narrative, typically one to several paragraphs describing what the risk factors are. And so in our setting, and I just kind of go back to this, here's what we're trying to do. What we're basically saying is that when a company adds a risk factor into this section 1A, that's a new signal that allows investors to better understand this distribution and that should help, again, based on our prediction, reduce the uncertainty of uncertainty. Ditto, if a company actively chooses to pull a risk factor out, what that signals is that risk is no longer material to the company. That also is a piece of information that allows investors to understand this distribution. And so what we go through is a analysis, a process to try to identify changes in these risk factor topics and use that as our proxy for the signals or the risk disclosures that companies are providing. And you can see the process right there is identify item 1A in the 10K report, extract the individual risk factors, including the uh, headers that are provided, and then what Federico does is all based on things that he picked up uh, learning a lot about textual analysis is we apply an algorithm to compare the text across the two years, two adjacent years to see whether or not a risk factor has been added or uh, removed. Okay. Oliver, it looks like you got your hand up. Yeah, just a question, Eddie. So I, um, are you going after 
the underlying events here. So for example, there's probably a reason why they um, take it out of their 10K when they pull out a risk factor. For example, they might have disinvested something. Or is it very important to your paper and how you think about it, that it's about the disclosure informing? Are you or it just uh, it doesn't it doesn't matter for your for your project? How do you I, think about? I mean, this? in our mind, it's about. I don't think that the risk necessarily has happened. It's about the disclosure informing investors about what the company faces or will face in the future. That that's how we're interpreting, it, right? It's this mm -hmm. idea because many of these disclosures, honestly, if you start reading through a lot of these one A sections. I mean, it's a hodgepodge. It's it's a mix of things that companies face right now. Some of these are far into the future type risks as well. And so, but the general idea is that if you go back to a general valuation theory, right, what Federico talked about early in the presentation, you have your stream of cash flows going out into the future, but then you also have these these exposures that the company faces, and these disclosures are helping to reveal what does, um, factor exposures the company faces. I think that's how we're interpreting it. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, I mean, so I guess when it's about the disclosure, then uh, like one risk, of course, is that there might be these underlying events that are driving these disclosures and then also the changes in the uncertainty about the uncertainty, right? So I guess maybe just just a thought if you, if, um, if, if, if you want to kind of disentangle between those, then to some extent thinking about and maybe through textual analysis, trying to hold these underlying event, uh, events a bit constant and or even just understanding what these underlying events are. So for example, just thinking about running a determinant model of having these changes in the first place. Uh, I mean, you might show that uh, show us uh, to that in a second, but um, kind of um, just, I just want to encourage you to kind of think about okay how uh, how where can you go that you disentangle the disclosure from the underlying event that might drive it and the same thing so that we can really think about the disclosure as the as the event so speaking that is reducing the uncertainty about uncertainty. Yeah, it's a great point. And Federico, in a few minutes, he's going to walk us through the the research design and talk about we're including controls for risk number one, and then we're also going through a matching process to try to. Uh, tease those things out as well. It's a great point, Oliver. I fully agree with it. Yep. Ayung? Hey, Eddie. Um, my question is about, uh, is, I understand it's a mandatory disclosure, but firms do have their discussion over how granular their risk factors is defined, right? So think about two identical companies as identical underlying business transactions, right? One, um, classify all the risks into five buckets. And then they are going to disclose up to five. And then sometimes there's addition and deletion. So for example, market risk, operations risk, et cetera, political risk. The other company has 100 uh, topics under operation risk will be supply chain risk, customer risk. It's, my first question is whether your result is more driven by those more granular uh, risk factor firms. Uh, and the second is, it seems that the granularity in their topics definition, you think about that, that is more like a chart of account in the traditional financial reporting system is that, isn't that the something kind of closer proxy to make with your theoretical construct because your answer to Oliver is you want to actually capture the information kind of like informativeness or granularity rather than just changes. So those are the two questions. So, Regarding the first question, I mean, one of the things that we'll, we'll do, we do in sensitivity analyses, and we also try to do explicitly in the regressions is to control for the number of risk factors. So again, we're, we're looking for something that's not just an artifact of company A chopping the salami a little bit into smaller slices relative to another company, right? That, that's not what we're looking for. Uh, so that's one piece. You know, can, can you repeat the second question then? So is there another, you have another proxy in mind that you think might be a, a more useful proxy? I think uh, the second proxy I have in mind is that whether you are able to capture how the quality, how granular the company's internal information has. So I think Eva Labo has some papers about like firms internal, internal information kind of like system was somehow mapped with their external disclosure or reporting system. So sometimes the number of factors they report maybe just because they have track of those detailed factors. 
right? One company only keep track of a general operation risk, but the other person uh, firm maybe go back to their individual suppliers and assess those individual risks. So their internal system just have a higher quality or more precise I, more granular yeah, than the yep. other one. Yeah. That, I mean, it feels like that circles to Oliver's question a little bit about almost a determinants model about why companies choose to report at a certain yeah. level of granularity versus not. And so that's that's something we'll have to think through a little bit more. I mean, I will say in a lot of these risk factor disclosures, there's a lot of peer comparisons that do happen. So in other words, if you're in the oil industry, you're going to talk about commodity prices. You're going to talk about uh, carbon pricing and climate change. I mean, that's a lot of the risks, the operational strategic risk, right? They they have an industry level component that tends to uh, cause companies to be pretty consistent in how they do things. Mm -hmm. And so that may be one lens that would help us to think through some type of determinants model. So th these are great points. Uh, we'll have to think about those a little bit more about how to incorporate those into an analysis. But again, I think oh, the- so, Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. I, I, think, I think one thing you can do is that probably try the topic modeling. Uh, for example, manually identify certain type of a risk, political risk, environmental risk, and then try to fit into the algorithm. So you have a standardized definition of the boundary of certain risk factor across firm, right? So that you don't allow those firms to define the right. boundaries, how wide or how narrow that particular risk is. So things right. are comparable across right. firms, right? Because no, you're running that, a panel. That's a good point. Yeah. Point. In fact, we have another project, uh, another topic for another day, Federico and I are working on. We're using the SASB, uh, the Sustainability Accounting Standard Board uh, materiality map. They provide uh, descriptions of particular material risks that companies face, and we're mapping those risks into these risk factors as a way to understand whether companies are consistently reporting with the recommendations of the SASB as well. So that's an application uh, like you described, Young. So very nice. Great comment. So let me go through this relatively quick. I'd like to get uh, Federico on board so he can start. Um, I feel like I've been yapping for a long time and then he can start uh, describing the research design a little bit. You know, as I said before, here's an example of the risk factors that Chevron has. And let me just use uh, two slides just to illustrate what specifically we do with the textual algorithm that we have. So here you could see side by side 2009 and 2010 uh, from Chevron. These are the bolded topic sentences that Chevron is using to identify its risks. And you don't need to read them per se, except to note that you can see that there's a fair amount of stickiness uh, from year to year. Uh, you can see, for example, in uh, risk factor number one, so that's the first listed, we, we do it based on where the company lists it. And so risk factor number one, Chevron says they're exposed to these changing commodity prices. The wording does not change at all in the subsequent uh, 10K filing. In fact, you could see the same exact wording also for items two and three. And even when you drop down to four, you could see that they've adjusted the wording, but functionally, it looks like it's pretty much the same thing. What Federico does with his textual analysis algorithm is we're comparing these topic sentences against each other to identify whether or not the risk factor in 2010 matches up or aligns based on a textual algorithm to another factor uh, from the previous year. And you could see you have a one for one match in items one to three, but even for the fourth item, we would effectively, the algorithm would indicate that that's effectively the same. What changes in this example when you move to their other risk factors is that you can see again, five and six are exactly the same. But once you move to seven, that's the point where you could see they actually don't have anything related to that in 2009. That's an example of an added risk factor that we identify. And you can take that concept and now apply it. Chevron happens to be an easy example because they have a very limited number of risk factors. Uh, but we apply this algorithm. The typical company is reporting quite a bit more risk factors in the 20 to 30 range. And so when you see, like you see in number seven, that's an example of an added risk factor. Ditto, it can go the opposite way where you could see something in 2009, but you don't see in 2010. And that's a deleted risk factor. Both those cases we view as that's information investors see. It's now helps them to understand what's the right factor loading 
And that's the spirit in which we think the addition or deletion of the risk factor helps to reduce uncertainty about uncertainty. That's the basic idea, okay? So at this point, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna hand it over to Federico to talk about the research design. Federico, are you able to share screen now? Yes, I should be able to do so, hopefully. So you can hopefully see my slides, can you? Yes. Yes. Very cool. All right. So uh, in terms of the research design, um, we basically uh, used as our outcome variable, as Eddie was describing before, the variance risk premium. And so what is the variance risk premium? It's basically the difference between the future realized variance and the expected uh, ex ante option implied variance that we then multiply by minus one just for interpretability reasons. So we basically want to have a variance risk premium that is lower when we ex expect uh, a lower level of uncertainty about uncertainty or firm risk. So uh, one thing to be said about the variance risk premium is that we use this as our uh, measurement of uncertainty about uncertainty. And there is, uh, of course, uh, research and literature on the use of the variance risk premium, but I wanted to give you the, the main intuition behind using this measure. Um, so the main idea is that there is an empirical regularity in financial markets and in option markets, and this empirical regularity is that option traders tend to uh, pay more uh, for uh, future realized variance than the actual realized variance to hedge against future realized variance. And so if they pay more than the actual variance, there must be a reason for that. And this reason is that, that in fact, investors want to, uh, don't want to bear volatility risk. And so we interpret the volatility risk as in fact, the uncertainty about variance or the uncertainty about uncertainty, which is our theoretical construct. And that's why we use the variance risk premium. Um, as Eddie mentioned before, the theory we are building on also looks at other uh, higher moments of the stock returns distribution, such as skewness or kurtosis. But for this other uh, measurement constructs, of course, the predictions are more complex, and that's why we decide to use the variance risk premium. So uh, this is our outcome variable. This is our uh, capital market outcome variable. And our experimental variable has, in fact, to do with additions and deletions of individual risk factors within 10K filings. And so our main experimental variable is codified as an indicator variable that is that equals one whenever the uh, number of added and removed risk factors is in the top quintile uh, of the yearly distribution of disclosures. Uh, and this is basically our treatment variable. And then we have, of course, uh, our control uh, observations that we codify with a zero for added and removed risk factors in the bottom quintile of the yearly distribution. So I see, um, right, so we have a question by Sudipta. So uh, uh, yes, absolutely, uh, this is totally uh, correct. Um, yes, uh, we could just reverse the uh, equation and uh, avoid multiplying by minus one. Yes, very true, uh, and basically, the uh, the result would not change. Yes, uh, Young. So Federico, I I need uh, I just have a clarifying question. Yeah. So sure. is this de dependent variable capture some sort of the price per unit of uncertainty compared to uh, simply just using the implied volatility? One is about the quantity or volume of uncertainty, and then this is actually the the price per unit of yeah, it's I'm basically capturing. Yeah, it's it's a very good point, actually. Yes. So it's basically, so this idea of the variance risk premium is really a, a spread type of idea, right? So basically, we are trying to measure what is the spread that option traders are willing to pay to hedge against volatility risk. So, uh, and this price uh, basically in our mind captures the extent to which traders have ex anti uncertainty about uncertainty or ex anti uncertainty about future variance. So it's clearly a spread. It's, it's clearly a, 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 a price type of notion. Okay, thank you. 
It's a good point. Thanks. Um, so uh, again, uh, I just wanted to clarify that here our experimental variable is defined as an indicator variable, but we also stress test our results in a number of ways. And so we will define this in many, many different ways. Uh, both the experimental variable and the outcome variable will be defined in multiple uh, ways as we will see shortly. Um, so, of course, uh, we control, as Oliver was mentioning before, for a number of variables because we want to try and understand what is the effect of the disclosure signal on, in some sense, investors' actions or options traders' actions uh, or expectations about future uncertainty. So we control for uh, the general level of risk that characterizes a company by using the market-adjusted returns volatility, the beta, the volatility of operating cash flows and size. We also control for performance, uh, growth opportunities, and the capital structure of, of uh, corporations, the information environment, uh, and of course, uh, since this is uh, effectively a disclosure paper, we also, uh, in some sense, acknowledge the fact that corporations commit to long-term uh, uh, disclosure policies and therefore uh, uh, control for the propensity. We control for the propensity towards disclosures by uh, including the total length of the risk uh, of the 10K filing without uh, the risk factor section. So we do have questions. Yes. Um, Sudipta, so uh, have you considered using equity analysts risk ratings to construct in our DV? We actually haven't. Um, and it's probably something we can think about. Uh, yes, we actually haven't. In, in some sense, we need to think about how this would map into the specific uncertainty about uh, future uncertainty, um, but it's it's probably a good idea, so we can think more about it. Thanks very much, uh, Ayang. I think related to Sudipta's question is that uh, is there any motivation for uh, reason that why you choose this particular risk uh, proxy, that the price per unit of uncertainty, like is because it map better with the theory. Or it's because some nobody has examined it before, or or maybe you expect results will be would differ if we use, for example, equity analyst risk ratings, or simply just in private data. So what's the motivation for using uh, for using this DB? Yeah, this is an excellent point. So one uh, uh, one thing to be noted in my mind is that um, so there is this milestone paper by Karen Wu on the Rio Financial Studies 2009, which basically introduces the idea and the concept of the variance risk premium. So it's in some sense complex or not obvious uh, the measurement of this theoretical construct that is uncertainty about uncertainty. And so we thought that the variance risk premium would map uh, easily in some sense, given our view of what uncertainty about uncertainty is, uh, would map easily into the uh, actual theoretical construct. So the reason why we choose this measure, this empirical measure, is that we believe this measure fits pretty well with the underlying theory. Uh, and again, the idea and the underlying theory behind the variance risk premium is very well described within this paper by Karen Wu on the Review of Financial Studies in 2009. Of course, uh, we could also think about other measures, and I think it's a good suggestion. The only thing we need to be careful about is the extent to which these measures are truly capturing the theoretical construct we have in mind versus other things. So I guess it's certainly something we can think about, um, and, uh, uh, and, and probably it would also provide with some interesting uh, 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 robustness checks and, and tests, but we have to be careful in terms of the mapping from the theoretical uh, construct to the uh, empirical measure. So it, it's it's we have to think more about it, but it's a good idea, actually. I, th I think if there's any theory tell us that we should use the price per unit of uncertainty rather than just the uncertainty volume, then you don't really need to test other alternatives, right? That's, you just need that motivation. Uh, to kind of clear that mapping. I think that's when I read a paper, I, I have not found that claim or whether there actually exists such theory that motivates your empirical proxy. Yeah, but Eddie, you have something? Yeah, I, I just, uh, you know, I'll just add since, you know, I've used uh, variance risk premiums in a couple of other previous papers. And, you know, I, so Sudipta put in um, the chat box a couple of references to some other constructs. There's clearly 
uh, it's a well taken comment that there are other proxies that you can use, right? And so when you drop down from this theoretical notion of uncertainty about uncertainty down to the empirical proxy, what other things could you potentially use? And so we're certain open to considering these other ones. The nice thing about using implied volatilities and about using the VRP as Federico was just describing in the research design, the construct itself and what it really is, is precisely this. It is as, I, I believe personally, it's as close as you can get to this uh, theoretical idea of the uncertainty of uncertainty. That's exactly what option traders are doing and what they're trying to basically benefit, uh, benefit from within the marketplace. And so the linkage is really, really strong. We'll look at these other measures. Uh, um, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm familiar with most of them and I don't get the sense that whether it's because of self-selection reasons, you don't always have those measures available for the full set of firms or other things uh, that it's not clear to me that they'll actually provide better uh, proxies than what the VRP would provide. That, that's unclear to me, but it's worth the exploration. So we appreciate the comment. So a follow-up is that, can you, does the implied volatility excel without calculating the spread? also fit your, your, your theory? I mean, I think that the spread is probably a little stronger because it's capturing the perception of what, uh, I mean, effectively what a market participant is willing to pay conditional on the uncertainty that they face about the company. So I think that's probably a stronger measure. And, and that's, I think, again, more theoretically sound in terms of the mapping of what we want to capture. Okay, thanks. Yep. Um, so just a clarification question on the main independent variable, high risk factor disclosure. Federico, I'm wondering, is, there a, is this the conscious choice that you group additions and deletions together? Because it seems that the example you gave about Chevron and the yearly trend, it's all mostly about additions. And I suppose addition and deletions may imply different May have different implications to this relationship, negative relation with the uncertainty. So this is a very spot on comment. Uh, thanks very much. And actually, uh, we are in the process of extending our analysis to look differentially at additions and deletions, which is what you're suggesting. Now, one thing to be noted, though, is that there is no uh, theory about differential effects of addition or added or removed risk signals and the effect of these signals on uncertainty about uncertainty. So uh, we view the signals as being equally valuable to investors uh, to develop expectations about the distribution of uncertainty of that row parameter that I showed before. Uh, there's no theory that would predict uh, differential impacts, but I think it's an empirically interesting question and it's something that we are in the process of implementing the paper. Thanks. Yeah. All right, so let me move on. Um, we include uh, uh, fixed effects, in particular date fixed effects, year month fixed effects, and industry fixed effects. And we also control for other textual measures because of course we want to make sure that this particular uh, 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 textual measure that we introduce that is addition and deletions of individual risk factors is not just replicating or, or overlapping with other metrics and measures that are in the literature. And so we control for the change in the aggregated amount of text in the risk factor section. Okay, so of course there might be still endogeneity concerns. Uh, and so we uh, perform a matching design. So we match uh, high and low disclosure firms. We do an exact matching on industry date and the loss indicator. And then we, do, uh, we match on all the other control variables uh, using as our primary protocol a nearest neighbor matching approach and also entropy balancing the first and the second moment of each matched controls uh, distributions to level off any remaining differences that could be there after the primary matching. Okay, so the sample, uh, we look at uh, uh, disclosures between 2006 and 2019, because of course the SEC mandates uh, disclosures uh, to include a risk factor section from 2006. We lose some observations because the parsing algorithm requires to first of all, identify the risk factor section and then to identify individual risk factors within each risk factor section. And there are certain companies for which the layout and the formatting are known standard. 
Um, then we end up having a, a panel of almost 35,000 observations that we, uh, these are uh, yearly disclosure observations, and we match these yearly disclosure observations uh, with uh, monthly option data. So basically, effectively, by including uh, the date fixed effects, we are uh, running some sort of uh, Fama Macbeth regressions here. Um, so Five minutes left. Five minutes. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, so let me uh, move on very quickly. Of course, we do uh, match uh, and we find that the matching seems to be effective. I want to show you the primary results. So the primary results here uh, suggest that there is a strong uh, connection um, between um, uh, a re uh, added and remove risk factor disclosures and lower VRP, as we were predicting. And this connection seems to hold when we add uh, risk controls, when we add firm controls, when we add controls for the aggregated amount of textual disclosures. And so we find uh, uh, results which are consistent with our primary hypothesis. Uh, we stress test our results in a number of ways. So we use alternative definitions of our experimental variable. We use alternative definition of our uh, outcome variable, and so the VRP, and we find consistent results. Um, we use alternative matching protocols based on propensity score matching with and without replacement. Um, we use a placebo analysis in which the deep, the, the explanatory uh, factor is basically the change in the risk factor length. And this is just to show that by using measures that have been used before in the literature, we are unable to find results. Um, and so our measure is capturing something that is incremental and distinct with respect to what has been done in the literature before. Um, we also test the levels of added and removed risk factors. We control for the total number of risk factors. And we also control for the earnings surprise to just make sure that we are capturing something that comes from the 10K filing rather than from earnings announcements. Um, so I will leave this to the conclusions to Eddie. OK, uh, if you want, you can pull down the conclusions, uh, Federico. Yep. Thank you. You can go all the way through. And so maybe just to take a step back, first of all, um, you know, thank you for all the comments. Uh, in the paper right now, uh, what we're doing is we are in the process of revising the paper. Uh, it's under review at accounting review. And so we've, uh, hopefully what we've been able to do in the revision, um, the reviewers gave us a whole bunch of things to think about, uh, a number of analyses, alternative analyses to consider. And so we've been able to do most of those at this point. And the version of the paper that you have was the first submission. So we haven't been able to update the writing on the paper yet. And so getting the comments right now is actually very, very helpful and extremely timely because we could build them all uh, directly into the revision that we're gonna be doing. So thank you to everybody for them. The basic thing that we've been trying to do, the basic uh, goal that we have for the paper is to document this idea that when a company provides information about the risk factors that they face. So changes in risk factors, whether it's increases or decreases in risk factors, we think that we're able to show, we think quite comprehensively uh, because this thing appears robust across a really wide variety of sensitivity analyses. And you know, we really try to throw everything we can to try to, to make this thing go away. And it doesn't wanna go away, which tells us that it's a pretty robust finding. And the finding is that this seems to lower the VRP and the interpretation is that it leads to a lower perceived uncertainty. That's the idea. And critically, what's also important to just kind of positioning this in the text analysis literature and how that's been developing. So Federico in his dissertation also goes another step in terms of applying a new uh, approach to doing text analysis in the context of earnings announcements. And in this paper, same idea. One of the things that's important is that we document that things appear unique and incremental to typical text measures that have been used in the past. And again, that result does seem uh, very, very consistent and strong. And so the hope is that we provided something that is in support of and consistent with the theory proposed by uh, the Heinlein and Smith paper in particular. And again, as a just a last policy comment, and then we'll kind of move it to thank you and. Uh, announcement for, I think, the next uh, ADP presentation. Uh, final comment, I guess, is simply that, again, uh, we think that this can have policy implications. We think that this will be useful for uh, the SEC to consider, not only in terms of how much um, parameters they want to provide around risk disclosures, 
but also how much guidance that they're going to require companies to provide more thought about maybe mandating the uh, ordering of risk factors. Because if you want to have fun, pick up Tesla's annual report, and you can read through about 30 to 45 pages of risk factors, and you get a sense of just how kind of somewhat out of control some of this has become. And so I think there's a lot of guidance still to come uh, on the regulatory side. And Federico, if you can go to the next slide, please. I believe as per my requirement, this is an admission fee, but I'm happy of course to do it. Uh, so the next presentation for ADP is gonna be on November 4th. Uh, Pierre Lang is gonna be presenting and talking about pattern recognition and anomaly detection, bookkeeping data. So we look forward to Pierre's presentation. And again, I wanna thank Ayung Shinlei and uh, on behalf of Federico and Matt as well, uh, thank you all for your comments and your kind input. Uh, very, very useful and we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody for participating.